everybody, and welcome to Connecticut River Conservancy's first ever live stream. My name is Stacy Leonard, and I'm the events coordinator at CRC. We're so happy to have so many people joining us today and hope that you're staying healthy and safe during these challenging times. Live stream is our new lunchtime presentation series where you get to learn more about the rivers you love, ask questions, and interact with the river loving community, all from the comfort and safety of your home or wherever you may be. We're excited to bring our work and our rivers to you in this new format. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna share some Zoom tips. Your video and microphone have been turned off in case your dog barks or the kids interrupt. We welcome your questions. You can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. If you're on a computer, you can see the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen if you hover. And if you're on a phone, you may need to tap the bottom of your screen for that option to come up. The presentation will be roughly 30 minutes and we are recording this for later access and I will share the link for where to find it at the end. If you experience technical difficulties, please call Aliki, our behind the scenes Zoom guru at 413-772-2020 extension 207. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Andrew Fisk is CRC's phenomenal executive director. He'll be sharing his expertise and passion for migratory fish and why they're so important to river health. These strong swimmers are making their journey upstream as we speak. We hope you'll share with us what your favorite migratory fish is. Take it away, Andy. Maybe at the end you might have a different favorite migratory fish. I know I will tell you my favorite at the end. So again, um, we are talking about the Connecticut River watershed and we're talking about the migratory fish that live in our watershed. I think it's important when you think about our work to remember three words, clean, healthy, and full of life. We know that we've made tremendous progress in being able to clean up the Connecticut River and all of our rivers across the United States as a result of the Clean Water Act. Now our job is to make them healthy and full of life. And that full of life can be critters that have hands and feet like us, fins and feathers, flippers, pinchers, uh, you name it. Our job is to make our rivers now full of life. And that is the work that we need to do looking forward. I th think when you see this image of the Connecticut River watershed, you know that this is uh, New England's Great River, 410 miles long. It is a, uh, a, <clears throat> a very large watershed, and it's important to know when we're talking about these migratory fish that they can use up to 200 miles of the main stem river and its tributaries. So as far north historically as Bellows Falls and the large falls there was the habitat that was open for these migratory fish. And so that's an important point to remember that the work we do far upstream has consequences and implications for downstream and vice versa. So I think we all know that we've cleaned up our rivers and the stories from very long ago um, represent successes. And so in 1959, this image was taken of our board chairman at the time and his wife as they toured along the river. And this image was taken near Brattleboro, Vermont, one of the many communities that were still discharging raw sewage into their rivers. And this, uh, frankly, publicity stunt photo illustrated that at the time our rivers, frankly, ran with untreated sewage and many other insults and assaults. This image is from 1953 in Wethersfield Cove in Connecticut. And yes, that is raw sewage on the um, the blade of that oar. And whenever I see this image or remember from where we have come, I do hope that gentleman had pretty good balance uh, as he stood up in that boat in that miserable water. So today uh, you, you see the river. It's a, it's a gorgeous river. This image is up north near Fairleigh, Vermont. And I think when we look at the beautiful river today, it's important to remember what we don't see. And what we don't see are the many fish and other critters that live in the water. And I think it's very important to know that once we have cleaned up our rivers, they are not necessarily healthy and they're not necessarily full of life. And that's really our job is to fill them with life of all kinds. And today's presentation is talking about some of these migratory fish and our aspirations for how we can make ecological abundance because we know that ecological abundance also supports economic abundance. 
So migratory fish, another way to talk about migratory fish is the, the term diadromous. And so the evolutionary adaptation of diadromy is really incredibly remarkable. So if we think about all of the known species of fish, uh, there's numbers out there well north of 30,000 species of fish. Only 1% of those species have actually developed this ability to live in both fresh and salt water. And that's diadromous, right? And so it's a remarkable adaptation. And I think if you haven't thought about this, a way to analogize this is example yourself. And so if you were diadromous, you would, for example, be able to live in an environment where you breathed air, and then you would also be able to live in an environment where you breathe through the water, right? And so two fundamentally very different environments. And so less of these, 1% of these species of fish have evolved this adaptation to spend a portion of their life in salt water and then a portion of their life in fresh water. And there's two different versions of this. The anadromous species spend a majority of their life in the ocean and then come upriver and the catadromous species spend a majority of their life in freshwater and then go out to the ocean. And so there's two different variations on this. And so the idea um, from an evolution perspective, why would, a, why would a species work so hard to be able to have its physiology work in two different operating systems, so to speak? And you may remember from your high school biology um, how osmotic potential and how cells actually move salts between the cell walls and those pumps work in two different directions in these diadromous species of fish. And so as they leave the ocean and come into freshwater, their cells actually start working in the opposite direction to make them able to live in the freshwater system and vice versa. It's a remarkable adaptation. Why? What was the advantage from an evolutionary perspective? probably um, habitat or niches or food sources that other critters were not able to exploit. And so these creatures figured out a way to take advantage of things that other creatures weren't and made it work for them in terms of evolution. So it's a remarkable strategy from the perspective of the fish. And so this is where I'd like to leave three words with you today uh, to think about this presentation, empathy, respect, and imagination. And I think when you have both empathy and respect for these creatures, it'll help inform your passion for the restoration of the Connecticut and many other rivers um, in the United States. And so these fish are able to endure very long commutes in their work, and they are also able to endure a tremendous amount of physiological adaptations uh, for which we should have both empathy and respect for them. So let's talk about some of these fish and what these species actually provide to us. And so migratory species um, are important for a number of reasons. They have provided humans a predictable and abundant source of protein for thousands of years. And as the spring returns, and we are now in the middle of the spring returns here where the fish are migrating up the river, we know that every year these fish return and they are easy to find uh, and easy to um, support human populations. It's also important that these species link marine and freshwater ecosystems. They're bringing nutrients back and forth, and our ecosystems have actually evol evolved and require this migration of fish in order to sustain the other attributes in the ecosystem, including our terrestrial freshwater ecosystems. And they also support marine species that we like to eat, whether that's cod or striped bass and the like. And when you have abundant migratory populations in our nearshore environment, it makes it easier to catch those other species that have supported humans like cod and striped bass. And lastly, these species have provided significant uh, cultural, historical, and uh, totemic significance for us. There are many myths and stories and legends um, and traditions around these species of fish, both in European and Native American communities. And so they provide a tremendous amount of services uh, to us that are important for both ecological as well as economic abundance. All right, so you may have uh, thought about what your favorite migratory fish is already, and frequently people name the uh, Atlantic salmon, right? And so for this conversation in the Connecticut River, I'd like you to, if the Atlantic salmon is your number one migratory fish friend, I'd like you to put it aside for the moment and um, think about some of these other species. And that's because I think the Atlantic salmon 
as too long dominated our, our management objectives and also the, the political influence um, to restore our rivers. And there are other species of fish, frankly, that are important to learn about and pay attention to. The salmon has occupied too much of our attention. And so hold on to it because Salmo salar is a magnific magnificent fish and it is much to be um, respected, but there are other ones that I would like to bring to your attention. The striped bass, right? And so for those anglers out there, you know the striped bass. This fish has been important for uh, sustaining human communities for thousands of years. It's a large fish. Uh, record fish is over six feet, but typically these guys are uh, about up to four feet. They live a majority of their life in the ocean as adults, and in the spring they too come into our rivers uh, in order to spawn. What's unique about the striped bass, aside from being a voracious predator, is that it actually is able to move back and forth across a significant gradient of salinity um, as it is in the lower estuary. And it is moving around back and forth in these gradients and its physiology is really unique in terms of this adaptation for diadromous um, evolution. And so the striped bass now is a, um, a fish that is doing very, very well. And we'll talk about why that is uh, the case at the end of this presentation when we recognize here are the things that we can do to support these migratory fish. So anglers out there know this is a really great sport fish um, and represents an important part of uh, dynamics. Let's talk a little bit about the sturgeons. So uh, the Atlantic sturgeon, this is the, uh, the large um, sturgeon, this is six to eight feet long. It's one of many species of sturgeon. The sturgeon are really unique fish because they uh, don't have scales. They're essentially unchanged since um, tens of millions of years, so you can say they are in fact a, a prehistoric fish. And so the Atlantic sturgeon is that species that supported the caviar um, trade for many years, and this is a species that we were very effective in wiping out in a very short period of time. And so the Atlantic sturgeon uh, in the Connecticut River, we thought was entirely uh, extirpated or gone. We didn't think there was any of these sturgeon left until a couple of years ago. Um, some fishery researchers determined that there were uh, some juvenile Atlantic sturgeons in the lower Connecticut River. And we weren't really sure from where they came and some genetic information was obtained. And uh, lo and behold, uh, we do believe that there is a remnant population of Atlantic sturgeons in the lower Connecticut River. These Atlantic sturgeons typically only uh, use the lower river uh, for their habitat. And so what's really uh, inspiring and presents some hope is that somewhere in the lower Connecticut, there were at least two of these Atlantic sturgeons that had been working to raise a family. And the quest now is to actually find out where that spawning habitat is. And so I think it's a remarkable thing to think about these fish six to eight feet long, um, lurking in the lower Connecticut River without really anybody knowing they were there. So this represents some, some good hope that maybe this population will be rebuilding itself. There's another species of sturgeon in the Connecticut River, and that is the short-nosed sturgeon. Let's get that, there we go. Uh, the short-nosed sturgeon, is a species of sturgeon that actually uses a significant length of the river all the way up to Montague, Massachusetts. And these guys are, are smaller, they're only about three feet long, and as you can see they don't have the uh, the same snout on them, thus the, the short nose. And so these short nose sturgeon have been able to hang on in the Connecticut River despite some, uh, some adversity presented to them, largely from dam construction. Uh, the short-nosed sturgeon um, are numbered in the hundreds and they are federally listed. So it's the one species of fish in the Connecticut River that, that is listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And the short-nosed sturgeon has been able to spawn and uh, breed as far north as I mentioned up in Montague, Massachusetts, and does move up and down the river um, around and over the, uh, the dams, including the one at uh, Holyoke. Some interesting parts of the, uh, the sturgeon's life history um, and how they live and work in the river. There are many of those, but as you can see, they have those little whiskers in the front of their, um, their snout there, and that's actually how they are sensing and navigating in the river. And their jaw is on the underside of their mouth, and it's actually reticulated, and their jaw will actually uh, reach down, and they will forage as a benthic feeder across the bottom of the uh, ocean. And so it's a very unusual jaw structure, and those um, the 
the whiskers in the front of their nose are also unique to the sturgeon. But I think the one thing that I find um, really compelling about the sturgeon is their behavior. And if you are out on the river and lucky enough to see, sturgeon have this uh, behavior where they uh, leap. And we're not really sure why they do this. Perhaps it's to strip off um, parasites or bugs, or it's perhaps to strip out when they're spawning, remaining eggs or sperm. Other biologists think maybe they just do it because they're having fun. And it's a really great way to uh, express joy if you are a fish. So if you're lucky enough to see a sturgeon leaping in the river, um, you are uh, you are blessed. All right, here we get to the uh, American shad, and so this is really one of the uh, iconic species in the river. And this, I would say, uh, not the Atlantic salmon is really the um, the iconic fish of the river, and the shad has also supported human populations for thousands and thousands of years. And the shad is in this Allocene family. Um, and in uh, past years, you would see shad at the eight, nine, 10, and 11 pound sizes. And today the shad uh, population has changed so that a record size shad is only five or six pounds. Uh, they're swimming up river right now. Uh, about 15,000 or so have passed Holyoke Dam in the last couple of days. And these shad are migrating upriver, and they will travel as far north up to Bella's Falls and find the many tributaries in order to spawn and raise their families. And as they're swimming upriver, they're actually spawning as they go um, and laying eggs as they head north up the river. Um, and shad, like some of these other migratory fish, uh, can be repeat spawners, meaning they are in the ocean for a majority of their life, and they come up the river and spawn. And if you have a healthy population of these shad, up to 30% of them will actually leave the river again and go into the ocean and come back another year and spawn multiple times. That's a sign of a healthy population. And so that concept of repeat spawning is very, very critical to healthy migratory fish populations. What we know about the American shad now is that its population numbers um, are not anywhere near what they could be in this, in this river. And so shad struggle um, to get past dams and make it up into available habitat. And that's really the major challenge for the migratory fish that are not just um, tarrying in the estuary. Some of the other species in the Alosin range are the alewives and blueback herrings. And so these are smaller than the American shad. And um, they have the unenviable um, <laughs> job of frankly being eaten by everything. They are a food source in the ocean, they are a food source in the rivers, they are a food source when they are adults, and they are a food source when they are young. But they um, migrate into our rivers and uh, like the uh, shad, they are migrating up rivers all along the Atlantic uh, coast. And so we're seeing in the Connecticut what you're seeing and all the other rivers along the Atlantic coast. The alewives only make it into rivers um, and streams and ponds in Connecticut. And the blueback herring actually will migrate farther up and can make it all the way to Massachusetts and Vermont. Very closely related. Uh, it's difficult to tell them apart. Uh, particularly when they are young, uh, but they have very different strategies for how they raise their families. And so the alewives, you can find them swimming up in streams and ponds in Connecticut. Uh, the blueback herring actually only use the main stem uh, river in order to spawn and rear their families. And so these, um, many of these migratory species like the alewife, the herring, and the shad, the other important point about them is they return to their natal rivers. And so they come back to the river in which they were born and they are able to sense uh, their home river as they are swimming in the ocean um, as adults. And they are able to navigate back home largely based on the smell of their native river. Okay, uh, American eel. Now we've gotten into a migratory fish that has the exact opposite uh, um, evolutionary trend of diadromous. It is a catadromous species. And so this American eel you see here, it's two to three feet long, and this is an adult. And so these eels uh, spend the majority of their life, 20 to 30 years actually, in the small rivers and streams far up in the watershed. And we have historical information that these eels actually have been seen as far north as Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. So almost all the way up to the Canadian border. And these American eels, 
um, migrate out as adults. And so they leave the freshwater systems uh, usually in the fall at high river times and they drift out of our river systems into the ocean and spawn in the ocean, the opposite of these other species. And what's um, unique about the American eel is their life history and how they actually um, raised their families was unclear for a very long time. And there's some great stories back from the uh, 18th and 17th century about where eels came from because we didn't really know uh, where the juveniles came from because of their life history. And some people thought they just emerged from uh, puddles after the rain. And Isaac Walton, a very famous writer from the 17th century, was convinced that eels were born when the hair of a horse fell off into a puddle. And that hair of the horse then transformed into a, uh, an eel eventually. It wasn't until the late 19th century that we found out that the life history meant that the eels, as they leave our rivers, all of them from the North American Atlantic coast will go to the Sargasso Sea, which is that large gyre of algae and seaweed. And so the eels go to there, they breed and uh, spawn and die. All the eel, adult eels that go to the Sargasso Sea then die. And then the juveniles will ride the Gulf Stream back up and unlike the other species, they don't come back to a natal river. They will just find any river as they are drifting on the Gulf Stream. And the glass eels, you can see here an image, um, their strategy of uh, transparency is likely designed to avoid predators. And so these small eels will drift along the Gulf Stream and then ascend rivers as babies. And so these are the next phase of the life history of the eel. And what's unique about the eels as they are swimming up the rivers this spring, along with the other migratory fish, is they're actually able to ascend rocks and waterfalls. And so they're terrific climbers, and they over time have navigated way up into our watershed, um, slithering up the rocks um, adjacent to the waterfalls that our other migratory fish were actually leaping and jumping to get up past. And our last migratory fish, and I will tell you um, one that uh, does not nearly get enough respect, the sea lamprey. And so the sea lamprey is not a, an eel. And so it is also a prehistoric fish. And unlike an eel, it does not have a jaw. And so the sea lamprey is one of those species that I'm really pushing you to uh, increase your empathy for. And the sea lamprey this time of year as an adult is living in the ocean and it's migrating up the Connecticut River and they're starting to make it up into Massachusetts um, even as of a couple days ago. And so the sea lamprey, yes, it has this mouth um, that you are probably familiar with um, and its life history and its job is frankly not all that attractive. So yes, it does live on the flesh of other fish. When it's in the ocean, its jawed mouth excuse me, its tooth mouth actually attaches to other fish and its tongue is like a rasp. And yes, it does drill its rasp tongue into the side of fish in the ocean and it lives off those bodily fluids. Uh, when it is in the ocean, um, something happens and it's told it's time to rear a family. And these adult lampreys, four, five, six years old, begin to swim up our rivers. And right now, as they are swimming up their rivers, they are in the process of dying. And so these lamprey um, are not eating, they are becoming blind, their teeth are falling out, and uh, essentially the only thing that's within their body are eggs or sperm. And the last thing they are seeking to do is to raise a family. And so these lamprey are swimming up their rivers and they are ascending over dams and they are looking for tributary streams throughout the watershed. And yes, they too can migrate hundreds of miles up into the watershed. And what they are doing when they find a tributary stream is to build a nest. And so what's really terrific about fish is to know that they also built. And so this is an image here of a sea lamprey that is building a nest or a red. And so you can see in its mouth, it's actually picking up rocks. And so it's picking up rocks that are a little bit smaller than my fist. And it's arranging a circular nest in these cobble bottom streams. And what's terrific about the lamprey is that they actually are amazing hydrologic engineers. And so they are able to make this round nest. And at the downstream end of this nest in this cobble bottom stream that's flowing relatively rapidly, they build a little dam at the end. 
and what that does is produces an incredibly quiet and still little pocket of water in that flowing stream. And then the male and the female sea lamprey will intertwine, and the male lamprey, as it wraps himself around the female, actually digests the brown fat in a ridge along its back to warm up the female. And they release their sperm and eggs, and they broadcast release, and the eggs are fertilized. And the little amacetes, that's a baby lamprey, um, rest at the bottom of that dam in that nest. And then as they get a little bit larger, they eventually then migrate out. And those little amacetes then go to a soft bottom portion of that stream, perhaps at the mouth of that stream near the tributary. And those little amacetes then will, they'll wiggle into the, the dirt in the sediment. And for years, they will filter feed. And they have um, their little tails stuck in the sediment. And as they filter feed and grow, they will eventually transform into the lamprey that has that round tooth mouth. But for years, they are nothing more than a passive filter feeder. And as they get to be um, several years old and large enough and transform, they then out-migrate as these small uh, lamprey and head out to the ocean to complete their life cycle. One of the amazing parts of the migratory or diadromous uh, life cycle is this idea of a natal river or how the fish actually will find a place to return to. And the lamprey have a very interesting um, strategy. And so those little amacetes, those little babies, as they are nestled in the mud in those streams for several years, are releasing pheromones. And those pheromones are biological compounds that influence behavior in animals at incredibly small concentrations. And so at the parts per billion or trillion, these molecules are being released by the baby lamprey and they travel hundreds of miles down the river to the ocean and the adults in the spring are able to smell or sense those pheromones. And river systems that produce more pheromones attract more lampreys. And so the idea there is that the more of the baby lampreys that we can uh, produce, the more of the adults that will return with that remarkable ability to smell or sense those pheromone compounds. And so you may not think the lamprey is especially charismatic or may frankly um, give you a little bit of the creeps, but I ask you to think um, empathetically and respectfully about this lamprey because ultimately as these lamprey produce their families, they all die in these upper freshwater river systems. And what happens there is they release nutrients into these streams and therein is part of their job. Our freshwater stream ecosystems have evolved to expect these types of nutrients that are coming from the ocean because these creatures are absorbing um, compounds and uh, excuse me elements that are not available in these freshwater systems and we know these elements when these fish decompose support uh, those ecosystems so they are playing an integral role uh, despite them giving you the heebie-jeebies all right, so for the last part of this presentation, I would like to think a little bit, have you think a little bit about shifting baselines and imagination, uh, because our migratory fish populations um, are nowhere near numbers that they could or should be. And again, ecological abundance creates economic abundance. And I wanna have you think about, from your imagination, what the potential for our rivers could be. And so here are some numbers of fish that have returned to Holyoke at the dam there. We <clears throat> count and measure the number of fish that actually pass Holyoke Dam in the elevators. And this is data from 1970 up to about 2015 uh, at Holyoke for American shad and blueback herring. And so a good year for American shad has been almost 700,000 fish that pass Holyoke in the 1990s and blueback herring same. We also uh, saw a good year of 600,000 fish. And so we have seen the sad story for blueback herring recently of those numbers having crashed. And so 5,000 blueback herring returned to Holyoke last year. So a shadow of what those runs were in 20, 30, and 40 years ago. And so often we use this type of chart to frame how we think a population um, could get to. And so is 600,000 the right number? I would argue that it's not. So let's take a look at some of the numbers and factors that influence how fish are able to return to our rivers and become successful. Before we do that, I'll just show you a simple schematic um, of the river from Holyoke up to Vernon, Vermont. 
um, and give you an indication of what happens to fish as they seek to pass dams through the elevators or the fish ladders and what our current goals are. So right now we say that when a group of fish, oh, my chart is not, the graphic is not working. Oh, sorry, I've got a delay here. All right, the, uh, the animation doesn't seem to be working, so let me explain. So right now, up until uh, about six months ago, we expected that a group of fish that reach a dam, half of them should pass that dam. And then in turn, when that number half gets to the next dam, half of them should pass. And so that frankly is a, um, an aspiration or a management goal that doesn't really reflect the ecological potential of the river or these fish populations. But what you see here in the animation is what actually happens. And so we have for decades dealt with um, failed fish passage at Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. So where a large number of shad may make it past Holyoke, Massachusetts, um, and 50% of those fish should pass Turner's Falls, actually only between 5 and 10% of those fish on average have ever passed Turner's Falls. And that means significant numbers, hundreds of thousands of fish are not able to make it into what we know is very good habitat uh, north of Turner's Falls and up beyond Vernon, Vermont. And so we know that one of the difficulties we have is failed fish passage. Let's go to, all right, there we go. All right, so let's look at what the potential for our river system might be, and let's think about what the baseline number is. So you recall we saw those numbers at Holyoke, and 600,000 appeared to be a really great number for shad making it up the Connecticut River. If you go back into the historic record, uh, and these two academic researchers have done that, and you looked over a 100-year period, across what they call the Northwest Atlantic, which is essentially the Mid-Atlantic and New England. And you looked at shad landings, the number of shad that were brought into port by fishermen over this time, and you measured it in millions of kilograms. You would see, and this is um, you know, common sense, or we know this from our basic understanding of what we've done to fisheries a long time ago, in the late 19th century, we were bringing in um, many more fish than we currently are today. Well, let's take this chart and actually move it even farther back in time as these two researchers have done. And so this chart up here at the top, this is what was at the prior screen. If you then drop this into this chart here and then go backwards in time back to the early 19th century and look at records from a particular river, in this case, the Potomac River, again, for landings, the amount of shad that were actually brought into port by fishermen. And you see here that a number of between six and eight million kilograms in the late 19th century uh, was a, a good number compared to today, but pushed it even farther back in time and you see even larger numbers. And then when you look at this landing number and then you look at to the Potomac River specifically and you translate this into numbers of fish, Lindbergh and Waldman have said that the Potomac River which is a river system that is smaller than the Connecticut at the beginning of the 19th century would have supported 20 million American shad. So that I would argue is an appropriate ecological baseline for a river system um, like the Connecticut. So what's our baseline today? What is our management objective for the Connecticut River for American shad? Right now, the officially sanctioned plan to restore American shad in the Connecticut River assumes 1.2 million shad uh, enter the Connecticut River every year. And so I would argue that that number represents an accommodation to a near-term baseline and doesn't look far enough back in historic time to put forward a high aspirational goal for the migratory fish in our river. So where we see hundreds of thousands of American shad, we should see millions. And so what do we do? Well, there are things that we can do for this. And this is where not only imagination, but hard work and elbow grease come into play. Um, quickly, so what can we do? Regulations, right? When we establish regulations and standards, good things happen. This is a chart that shows the rebound of striped bass populations 
after fishing regulations were deployed for both commercial and recreational fishery. It described what kind of, what size fish you could take and over what period of time, and voila, the numbers have rebounded and the striped bass populations um, are doing quite well because of regulation. Better fish passage. Uh, here is Holyoke Dam. Holyoke Gas and Electric spent about 12 years and a lot of money to be able to significantly increase the ability of sturgeon and other species to navigate upriver and downriver. And this is bringing us back to the Atlantic salmon. So for years, our dams were constructed so that salmon could pass upstream. And we didn't think about other species navigating upriver, nor did we think about their progeny navigating downriver. And so now we are significantly re-engineering our dams so that all of these migratory species are able to get to a dam and navigate safely up and when they are leaving the river system, able to safely and effectively and timely leave the river systems safely. So re-engineering our dams, removing old deadbeat dams. There are thousands of dams in the watershed. And as we remove them, we reconnect habitat and make fish able to find more habitat, which means they can have uh, bigger families and more productive uh, jobs. Road crossings. Uh, there are even more road crossings, obviously, in the watershed, and often they are barriers to fish passage, as you can see in this culvert. And so when you replace those culverts with better road crossings, like this one in Haverhill, New Hampshire, uh, that have a flat bottom and do not cause a fish to have to jump up and try and navigate through a, a culvert, uh, you get better connection of habitat and opportunities to raise bigger families. And then don't forget the, uh, the wonderful art of planting trees. And so our riparian or riverside habitat is incredibly important to make healthy as well, because what it does is it provides um, shade and supports a healthier habitat for the fish. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of miles of riverbank that need our attention and love. And then lastly, going down to our coastal environments, it's important for us to um, stop building seawalls and groins and other hard structures and to create what are living shorelines. And this is an example of how structure and sand and plants actually is restoring an eroded shorefront, which provides nursery habitat for many of these migratory species that we talked about today. And so there is ample opportunities to improve our coastal habitats as well for these migratory species. And so the last thing I would like to leave you is this, this question, and it comes back to that imagination. So remember that you as an individual, you are an owner of these rivers and you are an owner and steward of everything that lives in them based on our common law. And so you have a place at the table and you have an opportunity to imagine what you want for your river. And the idea of imagining much more ecological abundance than we see today or have seen in the recent past is an important objective uh, for all of us. And I will leave it at there. So know that uh, there is plenty that you can do. I am happy to answer any questions um, or take anything from the, uh, the chat. Great, thank you, Andy. That was so interesting. I learned so much, um, especially um, intrigued by the, the joy of the, the leaping sturgeon. I hope it is partially out of fun. Um, so we have a few questions and I encourage others to keep adding your questions. Um, and if we don't have time to get to them all, uh, you can also contact Andy after this presentation, um, afisk at ctriver.org. Um, so Melissa asks, are there any diadromous fish that are no longer found in the Connecticut River that used to be there? Um, I don't, I wouldn't know exactly, but I think really it was the Atlantic sturgeon was the, um, was the species that we thought was gone um, and clearly is just barely hanging on. But I believe we do, uh, we do all of those species that um, have existed in the river today, just in a lot lower numbers. Great. Um, Angie says, great presentation and great images. You mentioned ichthyological speed dating. Tell us what ichthyology is. So that is the, uh, the people that spend their lives studying fish. And so it is the, uh, the scientific study of, of fish. 
I am not an ichthyologist. I am just a fish lover. So there are lots of really talented um, and dedicated fishery managers in the watershed. And I think one of the things we benefit from is the fact that the state and federal agencies in the Connecticut River watershed uh, collaborate very well. And that because our river crosses state boundaries, it is really important for all those ichthyologists to be able to coordinate their research and studies. And I think some of the studies and research that are underway really demonstrate that we have um, intellectual horsepower, the ichthyological horsepower, to, uh, to understand our river systems. And I think one of the, the, some of the interesting studies that are being looked at, and frankly, our river was not as well studied 10 years ago as it is today. If you look at some of these fish populations, shad, for example. So shad are these repeat spawners, and a healthy population of shad mean that maybe 30% of those shad will spawn two or even three times over their life. We know from the ichthyologists studying these shad that today only about 8% of our shad are repeat spawners. And so that's saying that they're exhausting themselves or putting a lot of their energy into other things. And we frankly think it's the um, commute, the energy they put trying to get past our dams and up fish ladders is being um, used at the expense of restoring or storing energy and calories to become a repeat spawner. So if we make their commutes easier, they are likely to uh, have more of these repeat spawners and have a healthier and stronger population. Great. Um, are there any webcams that show migrating fish on the river? There, um, there are a number of fish ladders throughout the watershed where the fish are observed by video cameras. And so those video cameras are actually uh, able to count by uh, artificial intelligence the fish moving by. I don't know that any of them are actually broadcasting live as webcams. Um, there is a webcam, I believe, in Maine on the Damariscotta River where you can see the, the alewives passing the, uh, the fish ladder in Damariscotta. I don't think there's any in our watershed, but we can check. Uh, Brita asks, how many species are there in the Connecticut River besides, uh oh, just, uh, besides an, an anadromous ones? That's a very good question, and I think we would have to look that up. There are a lot, um, but in general, rivers in New England and in this part of the world do not have as many fish species as you would see in the mid Atlantic. Um, or in other parts of the Atlantic coast. So the, the abundance or the diversity of our fish species is not as great as other places, but I, I couldn't give you the exact number. We'll find out. Um, William asks, what are the various permits that are needed to remove existing dams? Good question. So um, in general, the permitting for dam removal is largely um, state driven. Um, and so if there is not a hydropower or a power component to a dam, it's an old mill dam, it's largely a, a state permit from the uh, Departments of Environmental Protection. Um, how effective for fish, pa fish passage is the re-engineering of dams for fish passage on the Connecticut? For instance, only 8% of what is feasible or is fired. Are there other fauna that have been that have been or need to be considered as important in the re-engineering of dams that are or are not being accommodated? Great question. So again, to, to restate, for decades when we were requiring that hydropower dams had fish ladders or elevators, we were designing for Atlantic salmon, Salmo Salar, mighty swimmer. And so those uh, fish passage structures. Um, it's difficult to be able to design them for one species so that you can recreate a waterfall, and it's even harder for multiple species. And so in the last probably 20 years, as a result of a lot of research, we are understanding how a shad, which doesn't swim as strong as a salmon, is able to navigate up an artificial waterfall like a ladder. And the example at Holyoke is another facet of this. So the short-nosed sturgeon, 
short nose sturgeon were essentially, um, I wouldn't say completely trapped, but they had a real struggle when a short nose sturgeon living in Montague, Massachusetts would leave the river and drift downstream to the estuary. As it passed Holyoke, there really was no safe and effective downstream passage for that uh, short nose sturgeon. And so what Holyoke did over a period of 10 years was to design a way for that sturgeon as it came downstream to not get attracted to a turbine. That's not the way it should go through that dam and actually be able to be lifted up and over the dam and land in a safe uh, plunge pool and be able to head out to the estuary. That took a lot of engineering. Uh, we're still learning how effective that is. Uh, eels, how does an eel come downstream and not get passed through a turbine? Same thing, we're figuring that out. And some of that is simple racks or exclusion devices as opposed to um, a different passage structure. Um, so jury's out, doing better. It is an ongoing research endeavor and there's a really tremendous research facility in Turner's Falls, the um, Conti Anadromous Fist Research Lab. And they're doing a lot of work to figure out how passage structures for each of these species can work uh, ideally. There's a lot of different possible uh, ways and um, opportunities to do so much better than we've done in the past. Great. Uh, Don asks, if we are aware of old dams and tributary on tributaries, what is a good way to start a conversation with owners and others to get it removed? Good question. And that's really where a lot of this starts is a conversation with a, the owner. And so I think one of the ways when we start this conversation is to um, ask, oh, how does a property owner, um, what, do they, what do they see as the value of that dam? and understand how a property owner appreciates or doesn't what the dam provides to them. Often we find that um, insurance and realtors are encouraging these small non-powered dams to be removed for a liability perspective. And so often a conversation with a landowner and exploring insurance, liability, sale and marketability of the property will um, give them an opportunity to balance costs and benefits, and we see a lot of dam removals happening in order to clear a liability from a property. And then having a conversation about migratory fish. Um, often property owners, um, let's say you're in Vermont and you're on a tributary stream off of a tributary. They may not understand that if that dam goes away, they have an opportunity to increase the life in their stream. And we see that a lot when you explain what can happen ecologically, people get really fired up. There's a lot of great examples of people saying, let's do this. I, I didn't understand. I used to have a beautiful little pool here, but I want a flowing stream again. And I want to welcome the fish back up to this part of, uh, of the watershed. So and Andy, listen, might... ask questions um, and take it from there. That's always good advice for, for all conversation. Might we suggest people contact you or someone at TRC for more information about removing dams like that? Sure, yeah. If you're a dam owner or you know people um, that there's a dam, please do. We have a lot of active dam removal projects underway. We're doing two to four a year, and we've got a queue of about eight or 10 potential dam removals um, at any one point in time. So we're always looking for more. Great. And just an FYI, we'll have a presentation later in the series from Ron Rhodes, who's our river steward up north, who is responsible for coordinating the dam removals that CRC takes part in. So stay tuned for that. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, Jesse asks, is there anything individuals can do to encourage industry to improve the fish flow at Turner's Fall? Sure. Um, so the, uh, the relicensing of um, hydropower dams, long, complicated, technical, um, really arcane, but there is a tremendous amount of room for the public to say, this is what we care about, this is what we wanna see happen, and to lend your voice. And so if you wanna reach out to us through our uh, e-blasts, paying attention to when we provide opportunities or updates, you can always weigh in via us. And there are also opportunities to weigh in with the federal government. So your voice can definitely make a difference. 
following what we do, as well as other advocates, to um, be in the weeds over the many, many years it takes to be able to put these licenses together is incredibly important. So feel free to get in touch with uh, me. And if you don't have enough information or you want to get connected, please do send me an email and we can get you uh, connected. We do need to speak up and make Turner's Falls uh, much more um, ecologically friendly for these hundreds of thousands of fish that should be uh, swimming right by and can't. Uh, Danny would like to know, Andy, if you can confirm who, which is your favorite fish and why? My favorite migratory fish, it's that lamprey. <laughs> I think think that it's got a tremendous life history. Um, okay, I, I can squint when I think about it in the ocean, but it's a remarkable opportunity to swim up river and do what it does at the very end of its life um, and its opportunity to be able to sense um, those pheromones. Um, when it's swimming out in the ocean, it's just that is truly remarkable. So it's not charismatic, but I like the lamprey. How about you, Danny? What's yours? I'll have to type that in. Separately, thank you. Um, here's a question from Don. I live on a small tributary on the Connecticut Mass border and I haven't seen any alewife. How can we help encourage higher alewife numbers? All right. So it sounds like you might be at the, um, a little bit north of where the alewives would return, but you might see the blueback herring. Um, and so the restoration of these migratory uh, fish populations, there's a lot we do in the freshwater environment and there's a lot we do in the ocean environment. So that's a good question. Much of the impact of the blueback herring and other of these smaller species um, is a result of bycatch in the ocean. So some of the things that we can do is support better regulation for the trawlers or those large uh, fishing vessels that are um, netting up the small forage species for fish oil and fish meal and to eliminate bycatch. And there's been some great regulations imposed that are starting to make progress um, at the ocean end of the problems for these guys. And then otherwise being able to support dam removals. So if you know of your streamers and there are old deadbeat dams there, let us know and you can help talk to property owners and landowners and we can start opening up habitat because that will help um, habitat. But again, the, the bluebacks, they breed in the main stem and it's the alewives on those tributaries. So you might be a little far north for alewife. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions and just wanna remind folks, if you didn't get your question answered or if you think of others later, you can um, write to Andy at afisk at ctriver.org. Um, will you Jim asks, what are the most worrisome invasive species in the river? Most worrisome. Well, I think I'm going to switch over to the, uh, the plants um, in answering that. So I think we have um, the unenviable distinction of having a number of invasive aquatic plants that are going to be problematic for habitat. And that includes uh, hydrilla and water chestnut. And so these species of aquatic plants will um, crowd out bottom, um, crowd out native habitat um, that uh, are native resident as well as a migratory fish like to use and also adversely affect water quality. So for now, I think we're really focused on those invasive aquatic um, plants. There are some other um, introduced fish um, that have been brought in over the years largely for um, sport fishing um, that have become accustomed um, and are in our rivers regardless. And I wouldn't really call them invasive, but introduced. And some of those do um, compete with some of our native migratory fish, but it's those invasive plants that I think we're paying attention to and wanting to um, see if we can control because the infestations are getting worse and worse. Okay. Um, to what degree has silting of the Long Island Sound affected the Connecticut River morphology? the silting of Long Island Sound. I don't, I don't know if I know the, the exact answer there because the, the Connecticut is an alluvial river system, right? And so there's a lot of sediment moving through it and the, the mouth of the river as, um, as known doesn't have a large 
urban population because it is constantly shifting sandbars and it's not been great for navigation. So clearly dams and development have changed how the Connecticut River moves, migrates, and erodes, but I couldn't give you an answer as far as how that specifically has impacted either the sound or the river. That was a tough one. Um, I'm going to end with this last, um, it's a, not actually a question, but a comment. Uh, David writes, operators on the St. Lawrence have found eel migration is keyed to moon phase. That sounds intriguing. Yeah, there are a lot of um, ways to be able to figure out when an eel is going to migrate. Moon phase, water temperature, flow, um, and there's a lot of farmer's almanac and other myths as well that try and explain it. But I have, I've seen some of that data about moon phase. What is it that, that eel can sense? They have uh, all these creatures have remarkable ways to perceive the environment that we really just barely understand. Well, thank you, Andy, and everybody for joining us today. We're at the end of our time. We're really happy to have this opportunity to share our work with you in this new way, and we hope you enjoyed connecting with your rivers this way. Um, just a couple of reminders, uh, this presentation recording will be posted on our website within 24 hours, and that link is triver.org slash live stream. Uh, if you have other questions, again, feel free to email Andy at afisk at ctriver.org. And we're running these, this series every other week on Wednesdays at noon, so we hope you'll come back and you can see our full list of episodes on our calendar, ctriver.org slash events. Um, and uh, we'll, I will send out an email with all these links and in it will be a short survey that we hope you can give us some feedback to help us improve these events for next time. So in the meantime, stay healthy and safe and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks thank for you coming out Andy. and spending time with us. And thank you, you Andy, in the back. <laughs>